Thank you very much on this uh, rainy Monday, isn't it? To be here talking about uh, the economy, oh my God, and how can I make, how can I make that kind of interesting for people here? Uh, so, um, well, I've got this idea I've been working on about the harmonic economy because um, one of the things as I was looking into uh, the free man movement a little bit and things like that, and I started to look into the monetary system a little bit, and a, a little thing dawned on me about numbers and how magical really the numbers are. So. And how, um, how magical, really, numbers are. And how, you know, numbers control so much around our life and everything we do in our life. We measure value with numbers, time with numbers. And in a way, um, I started to find other patterns in numbers recently. It's been a very interesting experience. And I started to apply that into how we, uh, how we negotiate our transactions, she would say. Okay? So this was the idea. It was an integrated financial vortex. A vortex. Now, generally speaking... What happens in our society is we're in a kind of you know, growth, you know, this growth outward model, which is all right, yeah? growth outward, you know, that's where we want the business, businesses to go and all this sort of thing when we, when we look in these financial areas. But actually, I wanted want to look at process, and I'm going to go into that a little bit more detail about how we can make more sustainable processes that actually are kind of more financially beneficial as well. So that, I call this kind of like a win-win situation. So it's kind of like we can dissolve the corporate enemy. You know, we don't need to have that anymore. And what we can do is replace it with actually a mutual beneficia beneficiary who's like a, you know, an artifact. So there's key benefits to this uh, model. It's a little bit dark in here, but basically it supports and supplements what we've got already. We do not need to change a thing. Everything is perfect in the system as it is once you understand how the system works. So we're gonna go a little bit in a second about how the system exactly works. But the other thing is, just by looking at the system a little bit differently, we could utilize it to expand our own creative potential. And that's really what I'm looking at here, is the value of human beings and the value of our own potential. And the last thing is that it works within a sustainable boundaries. So everything is in a boundary condition. This earth is a boundary condition, and the human being is a boundary condition within the earth. And what it is, we have a symbiotic relationship, and what, what we really want to do is we want to live in a kind of happy, peaceful environment but it's also in relationship to that planet, sustains life, and everyone gets on well. We don't have all these wars and things like that. So, money seems to be at the key of a lot of these issues, and it's one of the things that we're never taught about at school. Did anyone here, well, actually some people here, did anyone here get taught about it at school? No. You can sometimes go on and learn about money a little bit later on, can't we? Yeah? But we never get told about it when we're in the, you know, the growings of our, of our youth. And yet, in a way, it's the one thing that we all relate to, that we all know about money. Yeah? So we're going through this financial time, and some of it's very confusing. Some of these, uh, these statements are very confusing that are coming up. For example, how can we bail out all these banking you know, facilities yeah, that are supposed to support us? And then we go into debt, and then we've got to pay it all back, and then still it doesn't resolve the situation. So what is actually going on? Yeah? So we're living in a financial time. So, but if you look at the monetary system, it's kind of very simple, really. All you have is like, you've got going along this way, time, and then we've got another thing, which is value. You know, how much you've got in your bank or your pocket. And that's, that's all it is, really. I mean, does anyone have a different experience of money? It might be electronic, it might be you know, cash, it might be help, whatever, a, a, a mortgage payment or whatever. But at the end of the day, we always look at value and when is it that I need to pay that by? And that's all, that's all it is. So those are the two things. Now, what happened was, to make it a little bit more uh, interesting, they moved into this system called double entry bookkeeping, which meant that they just turned the time thing on its side and started going downwards in time because this, it wasn't working. We had these kind of crash periods, and so they, they made this idea where you could transfer debts between two kind of ledgers, yeah? But it's all on the cross, by the way. Now, if the cross is here, it doesn't matter how many crosses you kind of make, you still end up with the same kind of problem with this bust and boom cycle. So this has been a real interesting thing because you know, this monetary system controls so much of how we are, what we feel we can achieve, and yet we don't understand why, that's, why it's fluctuating and looking like that. So in recent times, that's been given rise to alternative currencies. So people have proposed many ideas for that sort of thing. We've got an alternative, alternative currency running here called the SOL. Yeah, you can 
pick that up from the bank, you can trade it like normal money. Brilliant, right? So here, you know, time bank stuff. You know, time bank was the idea, actually, we could translate money into time and everyone could have an equal time sort of value that it could be accredited to. Uh, another thing that's come up recently, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is this idea of actually, it's just like this electronic coin and you can just chuck the coin across, bypassing the bank from account to account using another digital service that could be eventually integrated into the existing financial service. But as well as that, I want us to try and think of value and money in a broader term. So what's happening is, is that the money spectrum is broadening. Okay, so in a way we have this kind of electronic money come in and that's created a whole new level of money. But as well as that, a lot of uh, transactions now are happening like through services such as eBay and things like that. And that's creating these kind of seller ratings, which in turn equates to a new kind of currency. And it's a new kind of currency because when people... Um, when people have a good seller rating, they're more likely to sell a product, which means there's more cash in their pockets, so it relates to the same thing once tri translated into the financial sphere. You see? Does everyone see how that, work how that works? So actually, this, the concept of money is expanding, it's flexible, it's not fixed. Okay? So, what is currency? So, I like to kind of use this metaphor. You've got this kind of river, okay? And the river's flowing from bank to bank, actually. And as the, the river flows from bank to bank, it sort of generates this thing called currency. Now, as an example of this, if you go back in history and you take a Roman coin, it does not hold the same value that it held when it was in circulation and use. But it's the same item in the physical, it's just that its relationship has changed. Now, the same goes a lot for our new system, because what we've got now is like this digital system. And with that, we get this increased rate of currency transactions that are happening now globally across the planet. So it isn't any, any surprise that with all this stuff going on, that someone's going to lose track of it all, and at some point it just disappears off. Okay? So what we get is we get this... I like, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a musician, right? So I like, I like the sound of the music, yeah? But what we get is this what I call the triangle wave. There's a particular type of wave you find when you're doing like, you know, sonic engineering and stuff like that. But that is what we get. It goes up like this and it crashes down again. Crashes down. And I was thinking, well, that's quite an interesting phenomenon. Why is it that we get this triangle wave? And here is a couple of you know, examples. It's, you know, and each time it, it seems to get bigger, this wave. This, you know, the, the amount of currency in circulation is going up. And the potential disaster for disaster is also increasing. So the question is why? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to just go through my understanding of money and banking right now, and I'm going to do it as quickly as I can to get a quick synopsis, because as I said, I don't think the system's at fault, I just don't think that we're being honest about how it's actually operating. So first of all, the concepts that we might know is the one of interest. So everyone's familiar with this idea of interest, okay? So when you get interest, what happens is, if you imagine this desert island of ten people, and one person decides they're going to lend their money at interest and everyone else is you know, trading away, what happens is the interest paid to that one person will start to filter into that one human being and they will begin to own all of the money supply. And over a period of time, remember it's only value and time, over a value of time the mathematical equation dictates that they will own it all because of interest. Now, it, you cannot escape that because there's only a certain amount of money, let's say. You know, let's say you, you draw it on the island. Everyone has 10 units. So you cannot escape that. If someone lends their money out of interest, they're sucking the money supply into their own pocket. Eventually they will claim it all because the debt can never be repaid. And that is kind of the situation we find ourselves in today. Now, the, the, the situation is also accel accelerating because of something called compound interest, which means that the interest has interest applied to the interest. So that makes it even more difficult for us, if this is what we call the principle, which means you know, the original money supply, this here is additional. Additional funds that need to be found. Additional value that needs to be drawn from the earth. So when you think about it, is it any reason that we're plundering the earth at such breakneck speed in order to create this value to fill the void. So you've got to think about that, right? Because we're sort of trying, we're challenged now with environmental times and everything we're talking about this, 
But actually behind it all, the game that these guys are playing is a numbers game and a financial game. It gets more exasperated by this thing called fractional reserve banking. And I don't know if anyone knows about fractional reserve banking. Has anyone heard the term? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Excellent. So fractional reserve banking, just for those who haven't, yeah, uh, is a way where you can deposit money in a bank. And that bank only needs to hold on to, say, 10% of that money, and it can lend out the rest again at interest. But because it's a closed loop system, because we have central banking, it never leaves that system. So in a sense, it goes back round into that system, and each time it goes back round into that system, it only needs to be, only need to keep the 10% on reserve, so you keep fractionalizing and fractionalizing on each loan. And what that means is, you end up creating exponentially more money out of thin air, from nothing, based solely on the principle that you only have to keep 10% of your reserves. That's what's called fractional reserve banking. You can see here that if you have 10% reserve that you need to hold, the additional amount of money that you will create of $100 or £100 is actually quite phenomenal. If we did that, it would be called illegal. That's all, right? Because we don't have a license to do it. And the licenses are granted by a certain institution. It could be. It could be. So the Bank of England, yeah, is an institution, right? Although it hasn't been around that long because we didn't actually used to allow interest at all. It was actually illegal, you know, unlawful, shall we say, to charge interest at all. And the reason was because it was quite clear, like I showed you before, that you shouldn't be making money, in a biblical sense, from nothing. Whereas nowadays we have the idea that actually to sit back and let your money do your work for you is the goal of our you know, of our being, it's the way we should aim for, it's the platform, the plateau of success. We can do nothing now, at last. We've worked, yes? We didn't like that in the old days. In the old days it was like, no, you work for your toil, and you get what you get. And that was called tithing, so there wasn't any what we call taxing, it was called tithing. And it works slightly differently, so I'm going to give you this practical example. Here we have a shepherd, and he has 100 sheep, and what happens is, there is a in that one year, they breed and he gets another 50 sheep. And that's 50 new stock, okay? And the tithe is 10%. So 150 sheep all in, all in together. How many sheep should be given up as a taxation or tithe? Does anyone think here? Five. five. One. Five. Yeah, yeah. It's true, it's five. In the current system, you'd be taxed on everything your profit and your principal. That's what's happening at the moment. You're being taxed on your principal, which is why the councils are selling all the land off, right? Because they haven't got any money. It's because the principal is being taxed. You see? And it cannot be avoided because of interest. It cannot be avoided because of interest. It's a perfect system, and that is exactly how it works through mathematics. Okay. So in the old days, we, we made sure that our original principle always remained intact because we recognized the value of that in order to carry on. So now what I'll do is, I've got a little video about money creation. Have we got, is the sound going to work on this or should I just talk them through it? Maybe I should just skip the video. It did it? Oh, okay, let's, let's try it. Yeah. A human being has an idea, writes a business plan, and signs it, which gives it commercial energy, turning it into a negotiable instrument. This is then presented at a bank for consideration. Note that ideas accepted by banks are based solely on their financial merit. These negotiable instruments are sold by the bank, generating new money, which is lent back to the borrower with interest. An account of debt is created by the bank that the human being is now responsible for paying back. However, the reality is that you created the money in the first place. You gave it value with your signature, and then someone lent it back to you with interest. So I just wanted to run you through that very quickly, because that is the money creation process. It's a little excerpt from a little video that I've, just, I've been making. Um, and I just want to run you through that again. But I just wanted to take a break because I wanted to sink in one key aspect of the system. And that is your power. And your power comes through your signature. 
Every time you sign a piece of paper, you give it the commercial energy because you are the only thing that can give the value. You are the only thing because you are the only thing that is alive. So that is how powerful you are. And if you take anything away from this talk, it will be to remember that one fact. So when you sign for something, you're giving power to it. And what I want to suggest is that at the moment, what happens with the system is that that money is kind of traded, and an account is created on the back of your signature, which created the funds. That's a key point. And I'll tell you why. I want to explain that in a little bit more detail. If you go to set up a bakery or something like that, let's use that simple example, what happens is you fill out your business plan, and your business plan will be a set of numbers. There'll be a financial breakdown which suggests that it can work financially. Everything in this world is numbers. It's not about morality, about how good the bread is or anything like that. You see? So because the numbers look good, they can release the funds because you request it, because you signed that business plan. Now that you've signed that business plan, the funds are created and you can go ahead and fulfill your dream in the knowledge that you're going to create the value and pay that back. And in, with interest to the people who allowed you to create that credit. Does, everyone, does that make sense to everyone? Is that a yes? <laughs> <laughs> now, understand that banking is a bit boring, okay? So I want to move away from banking, if that's all right. As long as we understand that at this point, we have the power through our signature, because this is going to be a key point to what I'm going to talk about next. Yes? Yes. A PIN number is a digital equivalent of a signature because it needs life. It needs intelligent, cognitive life in order to function. Yeah, and that proves that life was behind it, something can happen. It's evidence of life. Is there any other questions about the signature thing? Just quickly, if you were to think back in your life to the signature, where did it first appear in your life? On your birth certificate, yeah. With the informant or father and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, you can look into all that stuff. But what I'm saying is, the important thing is to realize how powerful we are. And that's why I want to get out of this. So, negotiable instruments. I just want to give you a bit of an idea of where they came from. Yeah, we had this idea of, you know, most people with our kind of trade and exchange, we're in the, the world of substance. So, you know, Here's a cup of coffee, two pounds, thank you. It's, it's the world of physical, tangible things. But what happened was, when the, when the commercial uh, venturers went out across the seas, you know, it was a very uh, lucrative business, but also, because of the danger of losing your, your, your goods and cargo, it meant that it, was, you know, that it became unprofitable also. So what they did was they went on what was called limited liability insurance, all this sort of stuff, which is what we get now with our national insurance numbers and things like that. But to create these instruments, which were just human beings swearing that something existed here, that we could do this, and that's what it was. And that has grown from a way in which we've expanded empire into something which is now controlling the lives of every single person on this planet. So it's, a, it's been taken into a mechanism. So we're going to leave now the banking, right? We're going to go to numbers, because numbers I find far more exciting and interesting, to tell you the truth, yeah? And as I said, all, all money and all finance is based on numbers, because it's only based on time and value, which are just two lines with a number attached to it, all right? So we have this idea of a number line. And what happens is you have this zero point in the middle, which is where, you know, everything balances, okay? You know, you're not in debt, you're not making profit. And then we go up here to infinity and down there to infinity. And the idea is that we can continue expanding here into infinity and beyond in our growth of our businesses. That's what people are thinking, okay? But the truth is, you know, we know that's not true because there's also an infinity going down. And that's more likely where we're going at the moment, right? It's going down. <laughs> so that's what they call financial crisis, right? That's just a name for it, okay? But I'd also like to point out but between this zero and this one is also an infinity. Yeah? There is an infinity, look, it's in between there. 
But what happens is, is that we always like with our monetary systems to cut off that infinity. We don't like it either. We don't like to remind ourselves that it's there. So they call this you know, rounding up and rounding down process. But actually, you can have infinity with inside a finite space. Right? This is really cool because actually, it's like the human being, infinite potential within a finite space. Right, that's cool, right? Yeah. And here it is. You keep drawing triangles within triangles within triangles on into infinity within this shape. There's a boundary. And what I'm going to suggest is that there's more depth to numbers than this number line. And actually, if we start to look into how we can start utilizing these, we can create far more interesting interactive processes. So just to give you an example, if I take something in the physical, how flawed our, mon our monetary system is right now, if I take something in the physical, like a bar of chocolate, and I, it's me and my two friends, and you know, I'm a loving Kyron, by the way, and everyone likes chocolate, so I decided that to divide it into three, we will have a third each. Completely doable, right? However, if you do the same thing you have with 100 pounds, and I want to divide that into three, what's the answer? What is it that is wrong here? That there's something mathematically wrong. I can't divide 100 pounds between my three friends. The only way I can do it is if I minus one pence. So something is wrong with the way that we're using numbers. We're not looking at the divine infinity within the number line. We're just looking at a flat page. But that's not how life is. Life is a lot more dynamic. Life and time and energy and all of this stuff is what we're experiencing. And yet our model is a two-dimensional flat model. It doesn't represent anything. So time is money and money is creation. But actually, really what we want to do is to try and remove the money part and just get time into creation. Because actually you guys, I'm sure, have got some brilliant ideas about some stuff you could do if you had a bit of money, right? So, that's difficulty, isn't it? And then we've got this other thing. This, look, time's going across here, and as it's doing it, it's creating a wave like this. Very unsettling, not very natural, not a very natural wave. We want to create something a lot smoother. The kind of wave looks like this. It looks like a Fibonacci sequence. Does everyone know about the Fibonacci sequence? Yeah? Just for those who don't, it's, a very, it's just invented because you take the first number, you add it to the one behind. See, one plus one equals two, two plus one, three, five, three, five, eight, five, eight, thirteen. Get the idea? But what is quite interesting, this is actually how reality works. Now, you know, I tell you now, there is not a straight line in the universe. Have I told you that? <laughs> There's not a real straight line in the universe. And yet we're trying to model something with a straight line. So, is it any wonder that as you're going off this way, reality is curving up and disappearing off that way? That's not, that's not a problem, it's just mathematics. It's just the way we're using the, the current system is wrong, yeah? <clears throat> so the Fibonacci sequence is a very natural way of building the sequences that nature uses. Nature uses this, it's based on the golden mean. And you can see as these boxes grow, you can see this is a relationship you will find within your human body, within everything. And it's a very natural thing to be looking at. What I want you to look at is number 144. Okay, we're going to remember that one. Uh, we could look at numbers, uh, things like uh, number 55 is an interesting number as well. So we'll look at that in just a sec. And if you remember 1.6, we'll come into that as well. So I have this little question. How many trees can grow on an acre of land? Anyone? In how much time? I like it. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen the talk before? No, not that much. <laughs> yes, it's about how much time, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Because... Really, trees grow, seeds, right? And then they grow again. A like new generation of seed, yeah? it grows again. So actually, that's what we call a cycle of nature, and it's an, inf an infinite cycle as long as the Earth exists and the perpetual balance of the Earth. That might be, you know, okay, you know, it might be tomorrow that the world ends, and you know, we all end, da -da, big flash, but don't worry, because after that, we won't know about it, you see? <laughs> so don't worry. So, the point is, for my existence and my time on this planet, that that infinite potential exists infinitely for as long as I can perceive it. Because I'm in a dualistic world, and I'm perceiving that world, right? Now, one of the things about nature, what it does is it likes to do this doubling process. Right? The Fibonacci sequence is a part of it. Right? You know, you see all these things, the cells in our body, you know, dividing. You see, like, trees, and then they, they split and divide, and it creates this balanced structure, doesn't it? Very balanced. And I want to talk about the circular sort of shape. We don't use it very often in our, in our, mathematical, in our mathematics because they're kind of awkward shapes, circles. They've got infinity. Well, how many sides in a circle? Infinity. 
Two, two sides, inside and outside. One, you just go all the way around the outside. It's the oneness, yes, it could be all of those, and it is. It's, it's, it's an amazing shape, really. But if you look at it like this, if you split the circle in half and create a time, and it went up and down like that, that's a far nicer way for our financial system to operate. You see? Nice, smooth ebbs and flows. None of this crashing about business, which might upset the balance of nature, you know? Very smooth. Nature's very smooth and organic. You just gotta look at how it works, right? And that's why I'm using vortex mathematics to describe this new dimension. And it's a vortexual mathematics system that um, was popularized by Marco Rodin, but it actually comes from the Vedic system. So we're gonna quickly talk now about uh, vortex maths. How am I doing for time? Let's check it in. Okay, we'll whip through this very quickly. So, <laughs> right, sorry about this. Right. <clears throat> so, every doubling principle, yeah? So here we have it. Nine points around the circle, yeah? Just because ten is actually one, one beyond. Just think about that. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, so basically, one to two, yeah? Double, yeah? One double to two, yeah? Two doubles is four. Now, what I'd like you to recognize is that this here is exactly half the length of this here. So we have a geometric principle in operation here too. The next one, four, double to eight. Once again, this and this equals this. We have a geometric principle in operation. And I'll let you think about that because it's also here in the Vesper Pisces. You can see the same geometries appearing. It's another way of looking at it. It's the way I see it. Yeah? It's another way of looking at it, a vortex. Now something quite interesting happens here. Because 8 doubled, yeah, is a 16. Now, we don't have a 16, so what we have to do is you have to do something called additive mathematics, which is something they use in uh, sort of sacred maths. And so 1 plus 6 equals 7, so we take it down to the 7. Remember 1.6, by the way. Okay, so I'll just, we're going to whip through some mathematics because it carries on right the way through here. 5 doubled, or 7 doubled, sorry, would take you to the 5, yeah? Whether you double the 16, which takes you to the 32, or the 7, which takes you to the 14, when you add them together, 3, 2, 1, 4, you still always get 5. It's an infinite track, you cannot escape. Does everyone get that? Yeah. Okay, shall we run through it one more time? From 8, double is 16, okay? But we don't have a 16 on the circle, so we do something called additive maths. We add the 1 and the 6 together and we go to 7. Okay, 7 doubled, right, is 14. We add the 1 and the 4 together, is 5. Or 16 doubled. We can take it up from the 16. It doesn't have to be. That represents 7 and 16. Okay? It comes down to here, 32. Okay? Double, 16 doubled, 32. Always takes you to 5. There is no escape. It's a mathematical eventuality. And that will carry on across up to here, you see? 5 doubled equals 10. 1 plus 0 equals 1. 14 doubled is 28, 2 plus 8 equals 10, equals 1. 32 doubled will take you to 64. 6 plus 4 equals 10. You're always going to go back to 1. It's an eventuality. And what I mean eventuality is because you can't escape it. This is, this is hardcore coded into our existence. So it goes on and on and on, and you can follow the track round and round and round and round and round, on and on and on, into infinity, but within a boundary condition being the circle, okay? So now what we're doing is we're actually piloting sort of this way through space, okay? We've got another dimension here coming in. So I look at this sometimes with sacred geometry as we have a circle, circle which is like the feminine encompassing to the expansive shape and the triangle in the center which is the contractive shape. At the moment in our mathematical model we're only using two lines here Right? And we're going all wonky. So we need three planes of three straight lines to create a 3D shape that we can utilize. Also, the triangle representing the contractive space means that our model should also work as it contracts. Because remember, it's expanding and contracting. So here, one half takes you to 0 0.5. 0 plus 5 equals 5. Okay? And it says it doesn't matter. Oh, well, I've done that. There we go. Ah, so half, half of 0 0.5 is 0 0.25. Equal to 7, yeah? 0.125, that should be, yeah? 0.125. So it carries on, and it carries on also as you half the number on into infinity. It's a finite thing. Now, what I can I say to you, right? 
If you imagine your consciousness as a decimal point. Ah, ah revelation. <laughs> yes? All no, uh, oh, right. <laughs> imagine your consciousness as a decimal point. And on the one side, you know, you've got this numbers up here, right? And as you move your decimal point consciousness, you're evolving. You're evolving your consciousness. And that's what, in a way, I consider to be true spiritual value, right? Is when we start to work our way through the vortex. So, as we haven't got much time, I'm going to have to plough through all that. Just take my word for it. Look up on the website. <laughs> it creates this kind of infinite vortex like that, right? Okay, brilliant. <laughs> so, once again, you know, what it means is... Okay, I just want to show you this little thing, because... I started doing my own little research, and I created a little vortex... <coughs> vortex anomaly, right? And it helps you to sort of see this in linear form, because some people prefer numbers, okay? So like, can you see a pattern here? Look, 100 divided by 11, see? Or 100 divided by 111, or 100 divided by 111. Can you see a pattern there? Can everyone see that pattern? Yeah? yeah? Okay, good. So we're going to move into the next part, yeah? So the next part here is that remember, remember this 100%, okay? And actually out within that 100%, there's a set kind of numbers. There's these kind of there's these like floaty numbers, and they're in between these infinite points, yeah? And they all kind of merge, and it doesn't matter whether you use the, you know, one sets of ones, or two sets of ones, or three sets of ones, you always come to the same kind of number. So what I do here, I've got this 100% of reality, yeah? And I've compared it to one number, yeah? Now it might be, sometimes I've had to use up to four numbers, right? In order to get the right number here at the end. But these are infinite vortex numbers, and what happens is if you put them into the order of the rodent vortex numbers, which is 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 5, which is the number on that circle, you create this here, which is actually a linear mathematical algorithm, okay, where you can put something at the front, you can run it through this linear mathematical algorithm, and you will come up with something that is exactly 10 times smaller. It doesn't matter what number you put in, okay, because it's a vortex. And you might say, so we can go from 90 to 9. In by using this, okay? From there. But you can put any number in that, and it will always work out that way. And I just want to show you one little thing. You might notice the number's 144 in there. So 144. You might notice that 13 times 55 equals 1.75, yeah? And that is both within that equation. So it's all links into the Fibonacci sequence. And I remember I said to remember 1.6. Well, that's because if you basically take 8. And five, it's one point. It's, it's one point six that actually translates that yeah, mathematically. Yeah? Eight divided by one point six equals five. Or is it eight times one point six equals five? So anyway, very interesting, very interesting. But here you can see actually, so actually that equals one point six as well. So actually, this whole section here is like a double Fibonacci folding in on itself, and that is how reality works. It folds in on itself, these numbers collapsing in on themselves, and you cannot avoid it. That's how you became, that's how you became conscious. So, how does all that relate to our financial system? <laughs> <laughs> have I got time to go through it? I have to run through it. Okay. okay, so look, what I'm trying to say is here, we've got something else, haven't we? Another thing about life is a quality to life, isn't it? It's a quality being, it's a quality feeling. You know, that's, that's the kind of value. It's a vortex. I call it a vortex because once you get this other dimension, this other line on it, we can create a vortex. Yeah? And now, this is my model here. So it comes down like this. You've got this. Right? See, the cross is still there. It's actually got the rodent vortex mathematical symbol on the front there. So I'm going to just really quickly talk about value. So here we have this idea of the current value system Ta -da! and the result of that. Okay, lots of good. Well, so what we're trying to create is something a little bit smoother. Okay. So, one of the, one of the key issues is, what is how we mark our idea of success. And at the moment, it might look something like this. You know, posh houses, sexy women, great cars, lots of money, a yacht in the Bahamas. That is a measure in the mainstream media portrayed on us as success. And yet, if you think about it, that's the kind of goal set of reality we focus our lives on. And there is the value. But if we could move the value towards a heart-centered reality, it might look a little bit more like this. Community, growing, dancing, partying, having a good time, smiling. See? That's a different kind of successful life. And that's the kind of life I try to live. I'm not you know, particularly rich in that sense, but I'm very rich in the sense of the life that I've led over here. 
So my social and ethical value, I feel, has been quite high in my life, and I feel that's actually added something that make, makes me feel very happy. Okay, maybe I need a bit more balance in my financial life. <laughs> you know, there you go. But actually, I call this triple, triple bo bottom line value system, and another way I look at it is something called value with a capital V. And value with a capital V means everyone's benefiting from that, whereas small v values are just those financial values that only we benefit from. A small contract. If I have a contract with you, I can benefit from that value, but it doesn't transcend to everybody else necessarily. Don't we often have those problems with corporations doing things that we don't like? Okay? So I'm going to skip the video because I just said that very quickly. And just quickly talk about this, which is your thoughts are infinite. You have infinite potential. And that when your thoughts are communicated to people, they start to get an energy about them. That's another kind of energy. And once, once they are communicated, then we can start to create, that's partly why I'm telling you all this today, create true value. And true value is something that is inherent in everybody's life, every, kind of, every single moment, if we choose to take it. So what we've done is we've built this kind of, you know, this kind of sand castle in, our, in the sand, yeah? of, pro, of substance. And then, you know, we are building around, we think, oh, brilliant, looks great, yeah? But we all know that you know, nature could come along and just wash it all away, or a financial crash could you know, take it all apart. And that's just, that's just like fictional stuff, really. So what, what it is, is at the moment, the world has a fixation with something called substance. And what I'm looking at here is something called process. And I met a guy who was doing something called process architecture, and he gave me this kind of cunning idea to implement with this proven business strategy, which can be basically proven to bring all businesses more ethically into life, and apply that to a new kind of geometric model. And what I want to do is I want to take you through very quickly what I call the process and how it works. So you have an idea, a concept that you want to create, just as you did with the bakery, okay? And what you do is you can write that idea down and you can prove that you can show the value and you can, you can write that in triple bottom ter line terms or whatever, yeah? But the point is that you're setting up something. So that's the first stage, is to set up something. The next point is that you start to transact something. There's nothing different here from the standard business stuff that we all know, yeah? And then you, you're maintaining it. So you've transacted your idea for a while and then you're maintaining it after a while. The standard model is, this is what they call the break-even point, and then you start to make this thing called profit, okay? But the problem is what we do is we suffer from something called externalization of costs, which means that the business costs that detriment the environment and the output of that, of that organism operating, that organization operating, is that damage to the environment needs to be cleaned up by somebody, whether that's taxpayers or whoever, right? So rather than, rather than let those externalization of costs continue, what we do is we maintain the process longer, yeah? so that we can properly feed back and absorb how we're affecting our environment and take responsibility, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. And so then the next stage would be feedback. And feedback can come from our customers, blah, 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 whoever. Yeah? Even people who are protesting outside, right? Of the establishment where we're working because there's a reason why they're protesting, right? Okay, let's, let's, why should we have this divide? Why not take it on board and everyone move into a more financially sustainable and ethical place? Because now we can understand capital V values, we can see the value of that, right? So the next point, point, point is that there's a sustained process. You need to have a sustainable business, otherwise it needs to be in balance with the, with the environment, otherwise we're going to collapse the environment and you won't have a business. It's as simple as that. So it needs to be sustainable if it's going to have longevity attached. And the last point is the exit point. And this is one thing that a lot of people forget about, is that my life and everyone's life here is in a way limited, but life itself is infinite. And by that, Everything that we're creating in a way, if it was working towards the idea of succession, there would be a lot more depth of planning involved. And that's what we're lacking here. We're lacking a perception of time. It's not anything else, is that we can't, you know, we can't see the, the time ahead, what we could do, what, how things could be improved. Yeah? So that's why this becomes, if you do that, and you create something that is so good, you can reach something called double break-even, which I call infinite profit. And I could, I'm going to skip that, actually, because it's a little bit complicated. But infinite profit basically means we set up something that will carry on into perpetuity because it's so good. All right? So in order to do that, what you need to do is you need to have a refining process. And that's why this is a vortex, because you're actually going through it in another direction. So as you start to set up here, which is your feedback mechanism here, right? As you start to set that up, a new thing starts to appear inside 
and this is a new vortex and it's spinning around the other way. This is your negative side here. And what you're doing is you're turning it into a positive by utilizing funds that would be available because we can create them, right? To deal with your own problems and to refine your own business processes. Now, I can't say exactly what that will be because basically every case is unique and individual, right? But that, this is a harmonic model because as you're trying feedback, you're setting up your next thing, you see? It's, a, it's kind of like this double wave thing. As you're creating one thing, there's problems that are being created, so you're setting up to deal with that before you're going and calling the thing sustainable. We band around the word sustainable without really doing anything half the time, right? <coughs> so here, as we're exiting, it's because we've maintained this second thing long enough to mean that actually we have cleaned up our processes enough to really say, honestly, from our heart, this is a sustainable business process. And I think basically it comes from a maturity of everyone working together. It's actually all done through geometry and distance and everything like that. And then you, there's another thing I haven't gone on to in this talk. There's another thing here which is about this three, six, and nine, which is to do with preventing corruption. Because one thing about money is it corrupts a lot of people. They want to you know, get ahead and stop ahead of the game. But what, what you do is you always have a regulatory control. So actually, although if you think about this, it could be like an, um, a harmonic seal of approval. You could see it like that. Like the products at the moment, don't they? they carry kind of organic seals or approvals. Well. This could be a harmonic seal, but also it could become its own funding institution in many respects to fund social innovation that works towards these high standards of infinite profit. And I'm trying to give you an idea about very quickly because I know it's right over time and everything like that. So I'll just script through these lines. Uh -huh. Efficiency equals yeah profit and sustainability increased. So it's the process of our businesses and making them more efficient on the planet that actually leads us to a more sustainable environment. So what we need to do is we don't need to sort of fight things, we need to improve things to make them more efficient. And we need to map efficiency. And I think Chris will talk a little bit about that in his next talk. So just lastly, just to finish up, we do have product and we have services. Now products are things that we can create and grow, da -da -da, sustainable trees, da -da -da, right? And services are things in which yeah, we have to utilize resources to create. But if you create a good enough service, for example, let's say you create a, a, an interplanetary, or let's say a planetary <laughs> transportation system. Let's, let's remain there for a second. Let's hold that dream. Oh, okay. Uh, we've got this airline system and all that, but imagine it could be completely in balance with the environment. Yeah? Then actually that could be operated as a very convenient service for people to get around from A to B without having to use polluting cars, right? So things like here, we have all the products which we, which we know about, the bamboo, da -da 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 -da, and then things like electricity and things like that, which are high-tech services. Now, one of, many of us find ourselves caught in between <coughs> the wanting to have those high-tech services, electricity, da -da -da, and wanting to return back to nature. And I'm saying, because it's our reality, we can do both and we can create it. So, <coughs> just lastly, time is infinite, concepts are infinite. Number can be qualitative as well as quantitative. And I think I showed you the business process engineering there. As well as that value can be constructed in a process of natural equilibrium with the environment. We don't have to sacrifice the environment in order to create value. Efficient systems with less waste constitute greater value. So the, all, the whole idea about a vortex is that the energy is going concentric, which means we're refining the process. Very important. And lastly, value can be considered in terms of betterment of the human experience of the environment. And my True World Order talk was all about how we can improve our own specific systems from a human perspective and the way that we all live. So thank you very much for listening. That's the Harmonic Economy. Um, do check out the website, harmonicaeconomy.org. Um, I'd be more than happy to get loads of feedback and things like that because, as I say, I'm only just throwing this out. I understand time's moving on. But thank you very much for listening. Brain is perfect, you'll never get numbers in a whole new way, but it's all gosh. Hi, um, how do you put this into practice then in the real world? Okay, I like that. Yep. Um, I did say that, in a way, the way I could see it would be this there'd be several ways that you could do it. One would be through a harmonic seal of approval, so in other words, you know, you're working towards harmonic standards. Two, I've actually got a piece of software which allows you to map things using your harmonic business process. So I've talked about 
you know, that, that map of six things, yeah, and how that works. So if you think about it, if you've got a process that you can apply, then you're self-empowered. So I'll be developing that toolkit first for free for people to use, which is kind of like a mind mapping piece of software that Chris is going to develop. Uh, and Well, as Chris is developing, and he can probably show you some of that, so if you're around for the next talk, you'll understand more about the practical application. But I think also it provides an opportunity for those banking establishments that are scratching their head about what to do about all this, and the fact that we've got a very angry and, and are actually dealing with very serious issues here on the planet about you know, as continued survival and everything like this, yeah, to really take on board a wider perspective of the industry in which they live in. And that's the main thing, I think, is shifting perception. Because all it does is take a small shift of your perception and realize we can create our own social funds to engineer a properly sustainable civilization. So why don't we? That's it. Anybody else want to ask a question or make it? Could you just go back to that part about consciousness folding in on itself with the mathematics? All right. Just kind of skips it a bit. Okay, yeah, I mean, just a real quick story. I mean, I had a, I had a whole kind of process that I was going through a lot with number downloads recently. It's been really interesting, like dreaming numbers and shapes and things like this, and I've been quite into sacred geometry and stuff like that. And when I found Marco Rodin, I suppose the stuff started to wash over me, and I spent out, I thought I spent nights on Excel just tapping out numbers. And if you, if you play with numbers enough, what you can start to get is a sense of something else. Numbers start to take on a kind of character, a kind of feeling. And the three, six, and nine, you know, the way they dance is an interesting thing. And you start to look at the process about how they, and where they work. Now, I've been unearthing some very interesting mathematical algorithms. I don't know what it's all for at the moment. But the feeling is something to do with input energy. But there you go. But one of the things I was looking at, you know, was a guy called Victor Schalberg, because I do like a little bit of free energy stuff as well. And <clears throat> he said, as, as water sort of flows down certain shaped pipes, it kind of folds in on itself and it creates this zero resistance and it goes into sub-zero resistance and actually increases in speed. And I think, basically, what I'm trying to get at is that the, everything is a kind of, even thoughts are kind of energy. And as we map our thought processes in more detail with a, with a different perspective on time, so actually what happens is you realize that certain concepts relate to certain other things. And, certain, and you realize about the interconnectedness of your whole environment. And that's when consciousness folds in on itself, because all of a sudden you're working on a little idea like this, and it clicks into place of the puzzle, and it's just like, bang, wow, this is in something lo much larger. And if you've experienced that, that is what I mean by the realization point where it folds in on itself, or everything you did is just there in a nugget. And you can call it something like, I call this harmonic economy, and it sums up everything. <laughs>